All right, welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, please sign into the attendance if you can. Uh, we are now at class eight. I know it feels like we just started, but we're about a quarter of the way the semester. I know, it's crazy, right? It goes so fast, so fast. We've done a lot of material already. Today is the last class on finding and acquiring property. Starting in class on Thursday, we move on to the much harder stuff, which is present and future interest. We get a preview today. For Thursday, read very carefully. Okay. I mean that sincerely. It's only a few pages, but it's going to blow your mind. You're going to be like, what did you read, right? Read it carefully. I want to make sure today that we've cleared up all loose ends, that we don't have any issues on finding lost property and discovery. I want to clear everything up, okay? Because starting Thursday, we're going to change gears. Um, let me go through the poll from last class because there are a few points I wanted to. Um, sorry, I wanted to go through. Um, so this question, which I'm grateful someone asked, to be very obvious, we can't see it. Let me figure. Um, I made this point at least a dozen times. Discovery doctrine only applies to land. Conquest doctrine only applies to land. The fine doctrine applies to chattel. The rule of capture applies to fugitive resources. Um, I appreciate someone asked this, but you should know this cold by now, right? It is, I, I've been making this point for weeks, and if this is still not clear to you, come see me right away, because we got we got work to do. Uh, treasure trove, yes, I, I didn't mention it, but it, it's, it's something you should know. Uh, you would think, oh, buried treasure, right? Uh, if there's buried treasure on your land, you should belong to the person who uh, 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 owns a land, unless it happens to be in some under, uh, you know, deserted island, which is a slightly different rule. Uh, great class, thank you. I don't believe you. Um, yeah, a couple of you asked this class about the baseball, right? Why was the baseball considered fugitive resource rather than abandoned property? I actually agree with this question. I don't think it's a fugitive resource. I think the idea of treating a baseball like a fox is nuts. But I think the judge in San Francisco needed something. All right, well, I learned the Fox case in law school, so I'll do the Fox case, right? That's basically that's, that's basically what we have. Uh, there's not much more to it than that. I think those are probably the only decided case. Um, oh, clear. I like that. No question, no question, no question. Oh, yeah. A couple of you asked about attached versus unattached. And this is an important distinction. Um, the cases we discussed, right? in Hannah didn't really describe what attached means. We have examples. If it's literally buried in the soil, right, it's in the soil, um, that's attached. If it's sitting on top of a windowsill, perhaps even under some cobwebs, that's not attached. I think for your purposes, and again, I don't want to make this an absolute rule, but for your purposes, if it's buried, it's good enough for attached. If it's laying on the surface, Probably not attached. And the reason why is it probably got there recently. Right? The entire idea of something being buried is it's been there for such a long time, it's been forgotten about, and it's like, and like basically time has covered over, just dirt and soil and water's covered it over. So unless it's buried, you probably don't have attachment, but I but I reserve the right to sort of you know get creative and find different ways to um, connect property to a uh, connect a chattel to a to a land or something. I think a harder case, I may mention this in class last week, is what happens if it's buried in a house? So let's say there's a floorboard, right? And something falls between, you know, imagine a ring falls between the, the boards of a floor and it's buried inside the house. It's not under the soil, but it's actually within the floorboards. That actually might be attachment. I don't, I'm not positive. I don't think there's a good case on it, but that's a, just something to think about. All right. Uh, attach, attach. Uh, this question, yeah, I... I Thank you for asking. Yes. When a case discusses other cases, you have to know those other cases as well. They're not there just for fun, right? Especially Hannah versus Peel, there's like four or five subsidiary cases you need to know. All right, any other question in the last case? All right, let's do a few poll questions to get ourselves uh, thinking again on this on this Monday morning. Uh, where, where, where? 
how did it work? Okay, this is a class B. All right, so let's try this one. All right, um, short answer. What is the rule established by Hannah versus Peel? Question number one. What is the rule established by Hannah v. Peel? If you guys can say it simply, it's not easy, but we'll see what we get. We get. Five seconds or so. All right, who's up next? Oh, Miranda. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Miranda, tell us what is the rule stated briefly in Hannah? Got all the points I was looking for, but excellent. Thank you so much for that. Are you from Pittsburgh? Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's not. Are you from Pittsburgh? <laughs> okay, I lived in Western Pennsylvania. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry, you had this higher attack. I don't know why I was in here. Um, so I think Miranda made a couple of points I just want to reiterate, but for a very good job. So the first part to think about is who owns the land, right? That does make a difference under the law. If it's, you know, uh, owned by a person, we ask, is the item attached to the property, right? Is it attached? And that probably means buried, but it might mean something else, but at least it means buried. If it's attached to the property, then the chattel, the thing, belongs to the property owner. And this is the rule from Charmin and the rule from Briggs, Okay. But if it's not attached to the property, perhaps it's just lying on the surface somewhere, it goes to the finder. And this is Bridges versus Hawksworth. Okay. Now, I didn't mention Armory, right, the original case, because Armory really had nothing to do with where the property was located, right? The boy stole it and then he went to a jewelry, right? So the place where it was found made no difference in that case. But between Charmin, Briggs, and Bridges, so if it breaks and bridges different cases, we look to whether it's attached. All right. Take another 30 seconds or so and answer question two. Uh, short answer again. Number two, why did the shopkeeper prevail in McAvoy against Medina? <clears throat> Okay. All right, Tiffany, you want to help us out here? Yeah. Okay, what's the answer? Or what would you put at least? Okay, you're, you're absolutely right, but I'm looking for something just, just slightly different. There was a duty of care, right? And what do we call that duty of care? Okay, you're right. The the shopkeeper became a bailey, right? Was it voluntary or involuntary? It was an involuntary bailment, okay, right? But the court drew another distinction. <coughs> Where was the money found in the court? And what was the significance of the fact the money was found in the court? Why was that significant? It was significant. 
for the owner intentionally placed well. Ah, what's the distinction to score true in um, in that quarter? It was misplaced. It was not. It was not misplaced. Lost. lost. Good. You got the idea, yeah, right? Yeah. The court drew a distinction between when property is misplaced, right? I leave a wallet on a table. It goes to the property owner because it's effectively a bailment, right? You're, you're leaving it there. There's a duty of care for the shop owner to keep until the real person comes back. But if it's on the floor, if it's lost, then the property owner does not win, right? Then it goes to the... Finder. I think, yeah, yeah, exactly. The finder goes to the finder, and that's your own bridges. So, we basically have here is reconciling bridges and McAvoy. If it's lost under bridges, it goes to the finder. If it's misplaced under McAvoy, it goes to the property owner. Is everyone with me? Make sense? Yeah, the last class I think was pretty clear. I think it's probably the, probably the easiest class of the semester, effectively speaking. Not, not that it's easy, but compared to the other ones. Anything else we move on to our topic for today? All right, try one more. We got a lot of questions going in a row. All right, uh, and this will be for, I guess, Nick in about 30 seconds or so. Um, question number three, please. What are the three elements of giving a Gift. What are the three elements of giving a gift? Another five seconds or so. All right, up in here. All right, Nick, help us, sir. What are the three elements of a gift? Okay, number one, the donors have been, right? It's called, yeah, well, I'll get there in a second. I'll come back to you, okay? Um, it's often called donative intent. It's D O N A T I V E, donative intent. The donor must intend to give the gift, right? And I just want to make this very clear. The intent must be to give the gift permanently. It's not to give the item temporarily, perhaps as a bailment, right? It's not an intent to just, oh, you want to look at my new phone? I'll check it out. You can get back to me in five minutes, right? No, no. It's an intent to give it for good. The essence of a gift is it cannot be revoked. It cannot be revoked. We say it's irrevocable, right? It's irrevocable. Once you have that intent, right, you mean you're giving away, you're not getting it back. You know, you remember like no backsies, right? When you're kids, there's no backsies. This is for real. This is for permanent. All right. We got everyone? All right, Nicholas, what's the second? Actually, you know what? Yeah, yeah, what's the second element? We'll do second element first. Okay. This is the hardest part of the entire class which is delivery. Nicholas, why is delivery so complicated in this class? Because uh, it was disrupted or it was involved. So very good. Yeah, we'll come back to the terms in a minute. But the second element is actually delivered, right? With certain items that are small, delivery is fairly easy. You can just hand the person a ring or hand the person a book, right? But with bigger stuff, delivery gets messy. When you're on your deathbed, Delivery gets messy. When you have uh, some documents that are, that are not in your physical control, delivery gets very messy, right? The third element I'll just give you is acceptance, right? Um, acceptance is usually presumed upon delivery. That if I give you some valuable item, it's presumed that you've accepted it. But it's not automatic because you can decline a gift Right? What if I decide to give you like a pet rat? I, I was on the radio this morning. This, this girl had a pet rat. I don't know why. Right? If I give you a pet rat, you're like, um, no, thank you. 
right? And you turn it away. Even if I hand it to you, you're like, ew, no, no, it's a rat, right? You can decline a gift. You're not required to take a gift. You're not required to accept an inheritance, right? If your great, great aunt leaves you some property in your will that you don't want to acquire, you don't have to take it. You can say no. Uh, maybe you don't want to pay the property taxes on it. Maybe you just don't, don't care to even maintain it. You can decline a gift. But in the absence of declining it, it's almost deemed uh, automatically that you've accepted it. Okay, we're going to get to three gifts. Uh, three gifts, three elements. All right, but, but really, the intent is the most important because you have to have the intent to make it permanent. That's the Gruen case we'll talk about later. And then delivery is also very important. All right, let's try another question. This was actually in your reading, but we'll do it here. Question number four. Let's see what you guys do on this one. Multiple choice. A lot of questions today. It sort of shakes out that way sometimes. Um, o earns, earns. O owns a pearl ring while visiting her daughter, A. O leaves the ring on the bathroom sink. After O leaves, A discovers the ring. When A telephones O to discovery, O tells A to keep the ring as a gift. Has O made a gift to A? Yes or no? O, why is it O? O stands for original, right? I know it sounds so obvious, but that's was like, why is it O, Josh? O is the original. And usually A is the first person, B is the second person. It just makes it easier to keep track of who is who. That, that, that's the short answer. Okay, another five seconds. Let's see what you guys did in this one. Huh. Let's see. Okay, about 70% of you said yes, about 30% said no. All right, let's see. Well, what'd you put here? Okay, tell me why why you put yes. Um, so she left it originally, but after she was notified of it, she said she gave it a gift, so she already had so the other person had to have it. Possession of it. So let's do the three elements, right? What's the first element? Intent. She had intent. Did the did the mother have the intent to give the ring to the daughter? She did after she she developed the intent after. So delivery happened first. And intent happens second. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Can you do that? Uh, I think so. He's right. You can. So the answer is A. And let me explain why. Um, there's no requirement to do the three elements in order. It's sort of weird, but the law doesn't require it. So long as all three elements are present, you have a valid gift. And just think about this for a minute, right? Let's say in this scenario, the mother called and said, oh, yeah, you know, sweetheart, just keep the ring. Would the law really require the daughter saying, no, no, mom, that's not good enough. Let me give the ring back to you and you give it right back to me immediately, right? It's a waste of time, right? It's a waste of time for the daughter to give it to the mom and the mom to give it back to the daughter. All the elements are present. She got delivered, right? She accepted it, put on her finger or whatever, and, she, and the mother had the intent. This sort of uh, flipping up out of order makes things more efficient, right? It makes things more efficient because it eliminates a waste of time and or, or a necessary step of this sort of back and forth. And you can imagine, let's say they live very far apart. Let's say the ring was discovered years later. It's like, oh, you know, the mother's you know sick. Makes things easier. Yes, uh, Shadi. Um, in this context, does it say that like the present transfer piece of it really is just a distinction between a future gift? Um, I'm going to say yes, but I'm sure why later. Okay. You're getting a little ahead of me. But this is actually on page 115. This question, I didn't make it up. So it's in your book. Uh, so it, 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 you know, it's your kind of time to think about it in advance. Look at that. Microsoft Word Boot Camp. Sounds like, sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not delivered retrospective. It was delivered, period, right? It was delivered, and the intent came afterwards. Yeah. Boot camp. That was a lot of fun. No, this is... No, no, that's... A, 
that, that's a fair point. Deliver. Okay. She got the ring. Let's try the next question on the on the sheet. This is question five, which is and I apologize in advance, people die. Uh, it's just the <laughs> you'll find the nature of this class is people die. It's sort of grotesque. I don't care for it much, but people have to die for these questions to work. So question five. Suppose that A does not telephone O to tell her the ring has been found. A week later, at the end of friends, A surprises O by producing the ring. O takes the ring, looks at it, and then says, I want you, I want you to have it, it's yours. Okay. A tries the ring on, but it's too large for A's finger. O then says, let me wear it until you can get it cut down to fit you. Of course, O leaves the dinner wearing the ring, struck by a car, and is killed. All these people die. A sues the executor of O's estate, that is the mom's executor, and she seeks return of the ring. Can the gift be revoked? By O. Can the gift be revoked by O? All right, another five seconds. All right, uh, uh, Kinsey, what, what do you got here? Um, I said no, that it can't be revoked because um, she had the intent and then she delivered and then they accepted it. Yeah, so that's right. So 75% of the answer is good. The gift cannot be revoked. The answer is no. But let me explain why. Once you express the donative intent to give it, the gift is delivered. And this acceptance, that's it. It's permanent. Now, Kinsey, let me ask you a follow-up, please. What significance of, of the donor giving back to the mom to hold on to for, you know, for a week or two until they have to get sized? Um, what, make her a exactly, it's a bailment. Perfect, very good, thank you. It's a bailment. So the mom's only holding it for purpose looking at size. The fact that she gets murdered doesn't really eliminate that duty of care. It would just go onto her estate. And then the estate would hold on to the ring until it gets resized, and it goes back to the daughter. You'll see in these questions on gifts that often overlaps with bailments. So our, our, our topic from last week, the Last week we did involuntary bailments. In this question, the mother is a voluntary bailment, a voluntary bailee to be precise. So with gifts, it's voluntary bailment. With your finding lost property, it's often an involuntary bailment. Everyone see that distinction between voluntary and involuntary? So just make sure you get your terminology straight for the when you're writing your exam, your exam answers. All right, I'll get to the video later. All right, any other questions before we move on? Oh, I'm sorry, oh yeah, uh, Ben, go ahead. I'm sorry, you're not my peripheral vision. But the, the, the key point is there's some things, right? If, if someone leaves cash on the floor at a table, there's no donative intent. Right. Here, the key factor comes is you can have it. That's donative intent. It's a gift and not lost property. It's a property. Right. Yeah. The intent, really, really, the difference between class number seven and class number eight is intent, right? In class number seven, someone just lost their money or lost their ring, there's no intent. In this class, there is intent to give it, and that's why the intent is very important to establish. All right, let's see. What we got. Okay, um, let's talk about delivery for a bit. Uh, come on, why is delivery, or at least historically, why was delivery such an important element of the um, of the, of the topic of gifts? Why, why did they make such a big fuss about delivery? Avoid fraud. What do you mean? Why would the requirement of delivery avoid fraud? Well, because it shows that they, they gave it to the... 
Good. What's the, I mean, this is like a stupid question, but it's not. What's the best evidence, Imam? Right? What's the best evidence that you intended to give me a gift? I guess like witnesses or something. Witnesses can lie. Witnesses are not reliable. What's the best evidence that, you know, that that, that book, right? What's the best evidence that you want to give me that book as a gift? Uh, that I got the book, right? Think about the times in olden days, right, where people are not literate. They can't read, right? They can't write stuff down. Witnesses forget. Witnesses die. Witnesses lie. The best evidence of delivery is the actual thing, the item, which sounds great when you're actually able to deliver the physical thing. Like, who am I that book? It's, it's a little bit heavy. It's on the bigger side, right? But you can give it to me. I put it in my hands. I hold it. But we've noticed in property that it's not always possible to put something in your hands. You can't put a whale in your hands. You can't put oil in your hands. You can't put a river in your hands. So like with the rule of capture, the rule of gifts develop alternative ways to deliver property. Now I want to show you a video. It's, it's a couple minutes long, but it's good. Um, it's actually a preview of next class. This is how you actually convey land. I'll just play it. It's a funny video. Today we're talking with Michael Robinson from Robinson and Henry Law Practitioners. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for being This is showing how to do what's called livery of season. So you see it's actually spelled up here, right? L-I-V-E-R-Y of season. S-E-I-S-I-N. It's referenced in your book, but we'll get to it later. But this is how you actually convey land, how you deliver land, right? Can you actually hand someone a piece of property? No. You can do this. This will stay with you forever. You'll remember this video forever, trust me. We had done a previous segment. We were talking about deeds and the different types of deeds. We went through the standard six, but at the end, we started talking about a very old in which they used to transfer property, and it was called livery of season. Is that correct? Sure is, and that's where the redeed actually comes from, is that action. All right, real quick, what is livery of season? Oh, come on. Season recap. Okay. Uh, because pe most people were uh, illiterate uh, in England at the time this thing developed, uh, they would bring witnesses out uh, to the property, and witnesses would be able to witness the buyer giving money, the seller giving over the actual uh, physical parts of the property, namely uh, turf and twig, which is uh, the two things that it's called turf and twig ceremony. All right. So, for the first time ever on Broker IP TV, we'll do a reenactment here. I think it's an excellent right. idea. So what we're going to do is this, we're in Old England, and we're going to transfer property. And of course, we have to dress the part. You need the hat. Now, am I the uh, buyer or the seller? You are the buyer. And you're selling me this land. Yes, and we've come out here with two witnesses okay. to watch all, right. all this happening. And how does this procedure go? Okay. You're going to start by cutting out a piece of turf on the property. All right, so we'll just bend, and you hold on to that turf. I hold on to the turf. Okay. Now... Put money in the hole. All right. I got some cash. How about a buck? This buck is worth here. It's a couple shillings back in Old England. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, and then hand me the sod. This piece? Yes, you do. Okay. And I take the twig. Yes. Ready? I take Ready? the sod and I say this following. This turf and twig I give to thee as free as Athelstan gave to me. And I hope a loving brother that will be. And I... Twiggle you with the twig. The twiggle. Oh, yes, I do. And then I put it in the side and I hand it to you. Thank you. And then you take this the side and put it back in the hole. All right. And with that, you just bought this wonderful property. And I've been twiggled. Yes, you have. Wow. And the reason for that was so that blind people could still buy, buy and sell property even when they, you know, they couldn't see what was going on. They knew that they were at least beginning the twig and they knew that they were getting the property. Well, that's a heck of a lot easier than the three-hour closing today. Yeah. Uh, Very good. All right, that's enough. Um, so twiggle, right? You've learned a new word. Congratulations. But I want you to focus on why in medieval times they developed this ritual. Again, people could not read. They could not write. So it was very difficult to keep records. There was no paper records. They created this ritual to symbolize. Symbolize, right? Symbolic. To symbolize transferring a property. You couldn't literally hand someone a field. 
but you could hand someone a piece of dirt and, and soil and, and, and grass, right? You can hand them a piece of a twig from your soil. And it's a very like symbolic gesture. You're, you're literally putting the money into the soil. Just think about it. You're putting the money into the soil. What's the way of saying, I am giving you this land in exchange for money, putting the money in the soil, right? It's actually a very, I say logical approach. And if you think this is crazy, this practice exists till to this day. If you ever bought a house, there's actually something called closing, right? It's a process. And what's one of the last steps in the closing? The old owner puts the keys into your hands. Literally, they put the keys into your hand. It's a direct descendant of the turf and twig, right? The reason why you have people come together and do closing together is to cancer from each other. When you give me the key, that's symbolizing, okay, this is my house. Right? I can change the locks, but I don't need the actual key. But that's a symbolic gesture. All right, you'll never forget the twiggle, trust me. And we'll come back to the delivery of season as well. And we'll come up with the next class. All right, so we, we mentioned before that there are a couple of different ways to deliver, right? The easiest way is called actual delivery, right? Actual delivery. Actual delivery is easy. You hand the thing to the person, right? The ring, the, the whatever it is you're giving them. And with this actual delivery, the courts aren't really so concerned because you have proof, right? You have the item in your hands. But the other two are more tricky. Constructive and symbolic delivery. And Huma made a fair point a few minutes ago. The reason why courts are suspicious about constructive and symbolic delivery is fraud, right? If you don't have the actual item in your hand, how do we know that the donor actually intended to give it to you? Maybe the donor is dead now. Maybe the donor is in a coma, right? Maybe the donor changed his mind and is lying about it, right? How do we know what the donor's intent was at the time the gift was given? With a symbolic or constructive delivery, it's often hard. We have to rely on extrinsic evidence. If I can use the phrase from contract, right? We have to rely on evidence from outside of a written instrument. There's no written document. So we have to rely on something else. And that's often unreliable. People's memories fade. People lie, et cetera. Now, students often get very frustrated, saying, Josh, help me. What is symbolic delivery? All right. I'll give you a distinction, which I don't think is very good. <laughs> I think two of them sort of run together. So I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. Say, like, Josh, that doesn't work. Like, okay, you're fine. But at least let's try, Pedro. Let's try. What is constructive delivery? And I'll, I'll patch up in a bit with whoever we get through. So Pedro, help us out here. What's constructive delivery? The way I understand constructive delivery is that, let's say, I'm giving a car. I can't give someone the car, but I can give them the key to the car and then open up. That opens up access to the car. Right, right. Good. Just help us out one more question, Pedro. What does the word constructive mean by itself? And we've we've now done this word a couple different times. What's constructive mean? Right. Um, so it's basically <coughs> surrounding evidence that proves that this thing might have happened. Probably. Do you have one hundred percent of the necessary delivery? Uh, constructive. Yeah. Did you I do all everything needed? But is there actually 100%? Yeah, right. So when you see constructive, think of less than 100%, right? Maybe like 90%, maybe 80%. You've taken substantial steps towards delivery, but you haven't done everything. You haven't literally handed it to the person. And with some time, uh, some options, it's not possible. You can't hand someone a piano, right? Right. You can't just pick up a piano and just hand it to them. You'll kill them. All right. I'm watching a concert, apparently. Some people can, but I, I can't. I, I can't lift up a piano, right? Um, sorry, I want to talk about in console. No, um, no, but with constructive delivery, you can sort of push it close to 100%. But with constructive delivery, the courts are more skeptical because they want to make sure the intent is actually present. All right, uh, Christina. Symbolic delivery. How would you define symbolic delivery, please? So symbolic delivery is when you give a message to 
Very good. And you said donor. That's correct. The donor's intent. The manifestation of the donor's intent. And how is that intent manifested? Uh, usually in writing. Usually, but not always in writing. Very good. Thank you, Christina. There's usually some sort of written instrument. Something in writing saying, I intend to give it to the my son. I think of the letter, right, from the, from the Gruen case, right? So usually, there's something in writing. And writings are actually good. Because a writing can't be disputed. Oh, you can, but but writings are harder to dispute, right? As long as it's signed, it wasn't procured under, under duress, right? There's no fraud that it obtained it. Um, it's a valid conveyance. By the way, the word conveyance it means like convey. We use this word also, so we get a written instrument, a conveyance, etc. Right? Now, if I give you a written instrument, isn't also from constructive delivery? Well, yeah, it kind of is. Right? The line between constructive and symbolic is very thin. And very often one can be the other. So I wouldn't try to kill yourself trying to think of which side of the line it's on. Right? Just understand that both symbolic and constructive delivery don't, don't require actually conveying it. And know that symbolic is usually in writing. It doesn't have to be. All right. Everyone with me. Right? The risk, though, writing you do something short of writing a court can later come back and say no that's not valid we're not going to force the gift so you're always on the safer ground by having something in writing but you know there's no, no guarantee all right questions I'll give you a brief note. It's referenced in the readings on a very common type of gift dispute, which involves engagement rings. Right? Engagement rings. Some of you are nodding. Um, when you propose to someone, it's not a contract, right? If you ask, he says yes, and then they, you decide to break the marriage off, you can't sue her for breach, right? That, that's, and you're laughing, but. It's not a binding contract. Uh, in fact, the courts say it would go against public policy, I suppose, to compel a person to get married if they don't wish. Right? So you can't sue for damages if a person you know, decides to break off an engagement. But what about the ring? Right? The ring. Um, there's actually a lot of litigation over this issue, right? Where the donor, usually the guy, can actually sue the donee, the, 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 the bride to be, to return the ring. Um, the courts have actually construed an engagement ring not as a gift, because a gift can't be revoked, but as a conditional gift. As a conditional gift. That is a gift on the condition that you follow through and get married. Now, here it actually matters who broke up with the engagement, right? If I'll just see an example. If a guy gives a girl a ring and the girl breaks it off, she's at fault, so to speak. And then so she violated the condition. But if the guy gives a girl the, the ring and then the guy breaks it off, <laughs> then he's out of luck. <laughs> so really, these are sort of conditional gifts where fault does matter. Um, anyway. Follow them in the back of your head if you ever have a broken engagement ring. You have to sue for the ring. Anyway, there it is. Uh, let's do the first case. Oh, I don't see a name tag. I'm sorry. Leah. Leah. Okay, yeah. Just try to bring one. Make my life easier. Leah, all right. Let's do the facts in um, uh, Newman against Boss. The facts are actually kind of complicated. This might take a few, few, few minutes, but let's do the facts. So the plaintiff was a uh, housekeeper, kind of with the majority of the deceased to the defendant to be an ownership of All right, so let's just let's just sort of just take a step back. Okay, so who who are the people here? Let's just just we'll just get to the definite. So just how did this household come together? So the plaintiff was an orphan, and um, the man who died took her in 
Mm -hmm. He was a widow, right? His wife died. Right. Mm -hmm. Then what happened, Leah? Um, and then he was bringing his brother to Jerusalem to his parents. And uh, right before he died, he told her he was going to give her his house and everything in it. What else did he tell her? He made her a very big promise about oh, the piano. Like he was going to marry the housekeeper. It's like a soap opera dream, right? Um, <laughs> Leah, did you marry her? Yeah. No. Okay, thank you, Leah. Well, okay, let's just take a step back, right? So you have a guy. He's kind of old. He's in his 60s. His wife dies. An 18-year-old orphan moves into his house. He's living with her all alone. You can use your imagination, or better don't use your imagination, but you, you can, let me get myself canceled. You, you can imagine what happened, right? <laughs> right? Usually it was, Josh, that's gross, right? Um, you know, they were, they were having a relationship. I think we can just infer that. And as often happens, an older guy and a younger woman, he promises her that I will marry you. He does no such thing. He promises her, I'll give you all these things. He does not just think. So, I mean, it shouldn't surprise you that often older men make promises to younger women and <laughs> for, for reasons, and they don't follow through. Okay. So she's living there, thinking, oh, this is going to be amazing. Once he dies, I get all this great stuff. Uh, but then he gets sick, right? He has a stroke. And we, we learn about this scene in his bedroom. He can no longer speak, right? He lost his ability to speak. He can sort of point at stuff and it's kind of like, you know, make a little bit of noise, but he's he's really in, in a weak stage. Um, Jen, let me ask you a question. Who are the only witnesses to this, um, the, this uh, discussion inside of the bedroom? Who's the only people who witness it? Houston, who's a nurse, I believe, yeah. and Newman. Do we believe them? Uh, you're skeptical. You can be honest. Yeah, why are you skeptical? Jenny, you're allowed to be honest. You can be skeptical. Um, there's no... I mean, there's no reason for them to not lie about it. Oh my god, I love the answer. There's no reason for them not to lie. Stay with uh, it's easier for them to lie about it. They can lie. What's the incentive there to lie, Jen? They get all the... They get all the stuff. And maybe maybe the nurses are not it also. So you don't trust them. <laughs> right, okay. Good, very good. Thank you, Jen. So I, I'm actually with Jen on this one, right? I've read this case many times before. I don't believe this actually happened the way that it did, right? You have this old guy. He's basically incapacitated, he had a stroke. And he was a sophisticated guy, right? He had a businessman, right? He, 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 had, a, he had a large house, he had a lot of money. If a person wanted to do this, he could have done it much more methodically. He would have called for his lawyer and not his housekeeper slash girlfriend, right? What I think happened here, and this is, you know, maybe, maybe you can tell me I'm wrong, is that he was kind of like, oh, you know, I'll give you all these things when I die. He never really followed through and she just expected it. And then when it didn't happen, she's like, okay, well, let's sort of put stuff together. Does that sound about what you think? Okay, maybe, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just a cynic. Maybe I'm just mean. But just I I never found this story you know to be believable. All right now, let's just take the items one step at a time. Right, without question, he wanted to give her something. Right. Uh, so Brianna, there were, there were four principal items or four categories of items we're talking about. Right. So the first was, there was furniture that was actually moved into Newman's bedroom, right? So let's talk about the, with the furniture in her bedroom. What's the deal with the furniture moved into her bedroom, please? Yeah. So um, she said that she would get it for $25, and that was because they keep giving her while they were in my detention visas. Oh, excellent. Oh, such a good answer. Okay, so, so let me just take a step back. Uh, I wasn't getting it yet, but I'll do it now. Brianna, what's the difference between... An inter vivos gift and a testamentary gift. He gives a very good, uh, very good answer, and I have to type now. 
An inter vivos gift and a testamentary gift. Doesn't inter vivos get transferred while both are alive? Right, exactly. Perfect answer. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. You need to know these two terms inter vivos gift and testamentary gift. Uh, inter vivos, like viva, live, right? You know, Spanish, right? Inter vivos means a gift made during life while the person's still alive. All the gifts we've been talking about today, I give you a ring, I give you a book, etc. I give you turf and twig. Those are all inter vivos gifts. With an inter vivos gift, the intent is to convey it now in the present. It cannot be revoked. Right? You're conveying it now in the present, it cannot be revoked. You have the delivery, acceptance, all those, you know, all that stuff. But the intent is to give it now. An inter vivos gift does not need to be in writing. An inter vivos gift does not need to be in writing. Humam is right, there's a risk of fraud. But at least with the inter vivos gift, the donor's still alive. Right? The guy's still alive. He came back and said, Did you intend this? No, I didn't. Right? So inter vivos gifts, you don't need to have a writing. The actual act of handing over the gift is sufficient. In this case, the furniture was actually moved into Newman's bedroom, right? While Mr. Um, uh, what's Dan Pelt was still alive, right? If you're literally moving the furniture into a room, that's some pretty good evidence of delivery, right? That's some pretty good evidence of delivery. So the court rules you can keep the furniture. Now they had sold the furniture. But she got the forty-five dollars for the furniture, so that, that's sort of keeping it here in a minute. All right. Testamentary gifts are different, though. A testamentary gift will take place in the future, at a very specific moment when you die. Now, none of us know the moment we're going to die. Thank God. It'd be terrible if we did, right? But we, we will all die. We are all mortal. All men are mortal. We all die. A testamentary gift kicks in at the exact moment of your death. But a testamentary gift can be revoked. You can write a will and then rip up that will and make a new will. And rip up that will and make a third will, right? Let's say you have a new grandson. You want to give him something. And then your grandson becomes a jerk and take it away. You can do that. A testamentary gift can be revoked. It's not permanent because it's an intention to give it in the future upon your death. But the risk of fraud is much greater with a testamentary gift. Why? Because you're dead. Right? You can't come back and say what you really meant. Don't you want to say answer something, right? You're dead. You're dead. You can't come back. All you have is your will. That's why a testamentary gift must be in writing. A testamentary gift must be in writing. And not just in writing, there must be two witnesses who sign it. Independent witnesses, not like the person who stands to benefit. This is why, I think mean, to Jen's point, you have the nurse and the, and the girlfriend. Those are not reliable witnesses because they're the ones who are going to benefit from it. So you need to have compliance with the statute of wills. Can you remember the statute of frauds? There's the statute of wills. So it's another statute. The statute of fraud says you need to have two witnesses sign it, neutral witnesses, independent witnesses. And that's designed to prevent fraud. That if any doubt about what the will meant, you ask the witnesses, hey, what do you think? Now, of course, the witnesses can die, right? But at least create some buffer, some security to ensure there's not a fraud on the court. Right? Why does the distinction matter between inter vivos and testamentary? Because if it's testamentary, you have to have a writing. And if there's no writing, it's not a valid gift. So you always have people say, ah, this is a testamentary gift. It means a will, there's no writing, no statute of wills, no witnesses, right? But if it's inter vivos, well, then you don't need a writing. So much turns in this distinction, both the first case and second case are turning in this distinction, right? Everyone get the difference between an inter vivos gift and a testamentary gift? Everyone get this? Good. 
All right, so um, uh, Brianna gave us the first gift, right, which is the furniture in her room. This was actually delivered into Vivos. Clean gift, right? Uh, Sophia, help us out here. What about the piano, Miss Julia's piano? What's the deal with that? Yeah. Um, Do we know for sure what his intent was with, with the piano? Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Sophia. So again, the piano was inter may have been interview a skip. We don't know for sure, right? He called it Miss Julia's piano, but he never actually delivered it to her. He never actually put it in her room, for example, right? His intent was not clear. We know the piano was destroyed. He said he was going to buy her a new one. Of course, he never actually did it. This guy made a lot of promises, didn't he? They never followed through on. Yeah, sensing a pattern. Um, but the court said we have a new trial to determine what his intent was because they didn't know. All right. So the two intervivos gifts were the furniture in her room and the piano. But then we have these two gifts that were not intervivos. These are the items that Jen mentioned earlier that were allegedly gifted on his deathbed. So we have this other concept. Bonadio causa mortis, or also often called gift causa mortis. You'll see it. Bonadio means gift, right? You'll see it both ways. Brianna, help us out here. What is a donadio causa mortis or a gift causa mortis? <laughs> What does that mean? Right, so, so help us out, Brianna. If a person's about to die, are we going to require them to go through all the formalities of getting a witness and lawyers and papers and all that stuff? Not. Why not? It's an obvious answer. Yeah, we don't have time, right? If, you, if you're making a lawyer, they might just die before they even get their will. This is why people will often scratch wills on their, on their hospital bedsides, right? Um, now, Brianna, why are these sort of deathbed confessions uh, suspicious? Um, because it's oddly um, beneficial for people to see that they have a lot of Oh, it is. But in general, not, not just in this case, but in general, why are courts going to be suspicious of these deathbed confessions? Right. I mean, generally, Brianna, when a person is about to die, are they in the right state of mind? No. Do we trust what they're saying? Right. And can they be taken advantage of? Right. Right. It's not just you worry about fraud, it's worry about exploiting the dead. Right. For all we knew, Miss uh, uh Miss Julia was, was taking advantage of this guy and was just making stuff up to exploit him. We, we don't know. Uh, if you've ever been around a person who's on their deathbed, it's an awful experience. The last thing in the world you want to think about is like fighting over property, right? Because a person's mind is not there, right? They're thinking about other things and whatever's going through their mind. They might be in pain, right? They might be medicated. Their, their, their senses might be impaired, right? There are a million reasons why we don't want people who are about to die to, to make detailed uh, decisions about their property. But still the law recognized these for good reason. Again, people were illiterate, right? The, the idea of having a will is a fairly modern innovation. It's a 20, you know, not 20th century, but in the last couple hundred years, people start getting them. But back in the old days, you just say, Everything to my son, right? You just sort of just wave, you know, with your hand. You couldn't even speak. So we have this incident, right? And let's just walk through this. So Ryder, there's two there's two elements here, right? There's the furniture in the house, and then there's this life insurance policy that was inside one of the one of the dressers, right? Let's do the household furniture first. What is Julia's argument that he wants to give her all of the furniture in the house? Not just the furniture in her bedroom, but every, all the furnishings in the house. So he gives her keys that uh, can, one, unlock the furniture throughout the house. Okay, so did the key, he hands her this key, right? Could the key unlock every piece of furniture in the house? I think it only unlock like the main cabinet that has the life insurance policy in it. Right, so how would the key be a symbol of all the furniture in the house? 
was that he just said that he was gifting all of it to her, but I guess the key really is more symbolic that he's giving her advice to armoire, whatever was the locked cabinet. Was it possible for him to convey actual dis uh, delivery at that point? Uh, probably not. No, he was, he, he was dying and there's heavy furniture. So what did the court find, Ryder, with respect to the key? What was the significance of the key? So the key unlocked the physical furniture, so the furniture that was either delivered in her room, that was hers, and Good. also the furniture that she could unlock was hers as well. Good. But then there's a dispute of whether the life insurance... I'll get to the life insurance in a minute. That, that's, that's, that's a worse question in 30 seconds, right? Um, the court says she gets some furniture, but not all the furniture, right? The furniture she gets was... The furniture that could be opened with the key. That this was some form of constructive or maybe symbolic delivery. The court isn't entirely clear which one it is, right? Uh, a key could be a form of constructive or symbolic delivery. She got the furniture that would be opened up by that key. But then we get to what this case is really about. I don't think she cares about the furniture. She wants a three thousand life insurance policy. Now again, Laura, would it have been possible for Mr. Van Pelt to just put her name on the policy? Do that. I mean, earlier, not, I mean, right, not when he was dying, but earlier in his life when he was still, you know, alive and well, could he just put her name on the policy as a beneficiary? Yes. Yes. Could Mr. Van Pelt Laura have just handed her the life insurance policy? Uh, yeah, and he had the key right there, right? Right. Why do you think he didn't actually go ahead and hand her the policy, Laura? According to their story, that there's just too many items in the house for him to be handing everything to her, and he meant to just uh, constructively or symbolically give her everything by giving her the key and saying that everything was hers. Does the court believe that story? Uh, evidently, no. No, they don't. Why, do, why does the court not believe this, Laura? Uh, they think that these women are taking advantage of him. Yeah, I think they think the woman was taking advantage of him. That, that's right. Thank you very much. Right, the court says that if Van Pelt wants to give her the policy, he could have easily just said, Here, give you, hand you to the policy, actual delivery. That would have been very good evidence. Then she would have had the policy in her possession, and then she could have gone to the bank and said, Here's my policy, pay me. Right, that didn't happen. He never took it out of the drawer. For all we knew, he wanted to have this beautiful furniture, but he didn't care if he had the actual policy inside of it. The court's also skeptical of the gift cause of mortis doctrine, right? They're saying, look, we live in a modern era. Again, this is 100 years ago, but back then this was modern. We should not be allowing these deathbed confessions. Van Pelt was sophisticated. He was a businessman. He had been the mayor of his hometown. Right? This was not an idiot. If he wanted to give his girlfriend this money, he could have done it. The better answer, I think Jan and Laura made this point well, is he did not give this girlfriend the money. He wanted to go to his family, to his heirs. Right. He, he, if he wanted this woman to be taken, he would have married her. Right. By marrying her, that would have given him, given her security. He didn't do it. Um, it's a tale of all this time. Right. I love you. Uh, which is where we are. So in the end, was the value. Oh, be open with the key. But she did not get the three thousand dollar life. That's a lot of money, by the way. Three thousand dollars. That's a significant sum of money. Okay. All right. Questions on the on Van Pelt. It's a good case. I like this case. No, no one ever trusts the girl. I, I just I, every year I teach this. If people was like this, no, 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 no. They I wouldn't believe her. I don't know. No. You did? Okay. Yeah, I did. I'll say it. That's okay. You're allowed to. I think you loved her. You, so you think he screwed her over? <laughs> Ryder? Yeah. You think he was going in that direction, though? Um, I mean, he was selling a property that was valuable. I mean, he was really just pretty much allocating assets towards her already. Maybe not to the extent that 
Yeah. Okay. Fair. I, 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 get, I don't know. I wasn't there. Courtney, where were you in this case? Men are stupid for women. Got it. Check. So what does that mean? Sugar baby toys, okay. If you if you know if you're in Texas, the Anna Nicole Smith story, did that name ring a bell? What's her name? Vicky Lynn Marshall, I think her name was. Yeah, this was a uh, just Google it. She was a was she a Playboy? I think she was, yeah. She she was a just Google her. She was a she was a Playboy model. She married this very wealthy Texan, uh what's his name? Um uh Pierce Marshall, I can't remember his first name, but he was a billionaire, really wealthy guy. And she was in her 20s, he was like in his 80s. And then he died. And then there was like almost a decade of litigation over the will, over whether he intended to give it to his kids or give it to her. Right? Did she have an OD or something? I think she had over. And, and then they're still fighting over the money. I just went to the Supreme Court twice, this case. It was just it was an insane case. Anyway, so yes. Thank you, Gordon. That's accurate. All right? Anything else on the first case? Yes, uh, uh, Brienne. Yes. So, so, so if if they thought there was actually an intent, I think he would have been enough, okay. right? If the court thought that the the, the, the Van Pelt intended to give the girl the insurance policy, I think he would have been sufficient to disrupt the board. Yeah, that'd, that'd be enough. Very good. All right, anything else on um, Van Pelt? All right, this next case is probably my favorite case in the book. I, you know, why? I, I love this case. One of my favorite cases. You'll see why in a few minutes, I think. Um, all right, Caden, so let's... Um, I think you're next. Uh, let's walk through the facts here. The facts are a little bit messy, right? So we have the father, and we have the son, right? And the son's about to celebrate his birthday. You know, big occasion. When I when I get, when I have my birthday, I don't think I get any parents, but you know. Uh, he got something really cool. What did he get? Okay, but uh, by the way, I don't know if you know Art. By the way, this is what Vince looked like. I don't know if it changes your opinion of him. Um, I don't know. All right. So this is a painting by Gustav Klimt. Uh, I don't like Art. I don't care about Art, but some people really like it. Do anyone like Art? I, I, I don't care. You like Art? You like Klimt? You like this painting? Uh, my favorite spy painter. Yeah. Someone actually, um, do you guys like Clint? I don't know. Uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know either. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so a couple of years ago, students actually went abroad to a museum in Europe and they threw back like a book of Clint painting. I was like, oh, thank you. It's nothing to do with it. Um, anyway, so I, I just, I don't need art books. No, thank you. All right, so we come to his 21st birthday. The father, Victor, wrote a letter to his son. Letter number one. Caden, what does letter number one say? Um, so be very, just be very precise with what we're talking about. Letter number one. I'm giving you this painting as a gift, but I want to hold on to it until I die. Okay, very good. <laughs> Do we have a copy of that letter in, in the record? No. Why do we not have a copy of that letter in the record? Uh, apparently, the father wrote another letter ah. requesting that that letter be sent back and destroyed based on legal advice that he had been given. Excellent. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just pause you right there. So the first letter said, I'll just read to you, it says, on your 21st birthday, I wish to give you as a present a painting by Gustav Klimt, which I own, uh, but I wish to retain possession for my lifetime. So Abby, let's just, just, just stop right there. What is the father's intent in the first letter? To give the gift after he dies. Let's just be precise though, right? He says, I wish to give you 
as a present a painting by Clip, but I will retain possession for my lifetime. What is the father's intent there, Abby? Huh. So what's the difference between title, ownership, and possession? You're using these words, which I, I think I cautioned you not to, but it's, it's okay. But I'll just ask the follow-up. What, what do you mean, title, ownership, possession? Like, he has all the rights in the bundle of sticks, so he can sell it. But he doesn't actually have... Okay, we're on the right track, actually. That's good. When the father wrote this first... And actually, I don't even care what the second letter says. It actually doesn't matter, right? Because a gift can't be revoked. So really what matters is the first gift. The second gift kind of just clarifies for tax law. I really don't care what the second letter says. So this bundle of sticks, Abby, right? I'll just finish up with you. Did the father give the son the entire bundle of sticks in the first letter? No. No, he didn't. So, Linda, I'll come to you for a second, right? We, we talk about properties of bundle of sticks, right? The father bought the painting in auction. He owned the entire bundle of sticks, right? We, we agree on that? He wrote this letter. With this letter, what did the father do to his bundle? Yeah, like so we got a couple of sticks. Did he give his son all the sticks in the bundle? Yeah. They gave his son some sticks. Who kept the other sticks? He retained them. Can you do that? Yeah, you can. So why don't you think of this case this way? The father had the full bundle of sticks, and he chopped up his bundle. He separated his bundle. He gave some of the sticks to his son, and why would he do that, Courtney? Why? Why would the father? Why would the father just give the entire bundle of sticks to his son? But why, why couldn't he just, so according to let's just ask hypothetical, why couldn't the father say, son, I'm giving you the entire bundle of sticks. And, you know, I gave you the bundle of sticks. Why don't you let me hold on to it in my house so I can keep hanging on my wall? Wouldn't that be nice? Son, I love you. Why couldn't he just do that? Forget the legal advice. I don't care. Uh, he did. He did. Got bad legal advice. But <laughs> what was the risk if he gave his son the entire bundle of sticks? Is it, hey, son, would you mind if I just keep that on display in my house? What, what's the risk of doing that? Could, would the son say, screw you, dad? He could. Right. Gift cannot be revoked. It's a very simple point, but it really matters in this case. Once this father gave the son the entire bundle of sticks, he wasn't getting it back. It was not going to hang on his wall unless the son was. It was probably going to hang on the son's wall. So the father, who loved his son, didn't love his son that much. You'll find in property, it's going to sound awful, but it's true. You can judge how much you love a person by how many sticks in the bundle you give them. I'm, I'm serious, right? If you really love them, you give them the full bundle of sticks. But if you love them... Most of the time, you keep you keep a stiff stick for yourself, right? So in, in in this letter, letter number one, the father gave the son most of the sticks in the bundle, but he kept one bundle for himself, one stick for himself. Marissa, what stick did the father keep for himself? Yeah. At what point in time? Yeah. Who's just to, to his? The father kept an interest to possess the painting during his life. And Marissa, what happens upon the father's death? Um, I don't care about the stepmother. There's no stepmother yet, right? Based on the letter. So who gets the full bundle of sticks when the father dies? So think of it this way, right? I'll just make it easy. Two sticks, right? At some point in the future, the son will have possession. But in the present moment, right now, the, the father keeps it hanging on this wall, right? So this is your bundle of sticks or two sticks. Makes it easy. 
When the father dies, the interests merge. The son has both the present and the future interests combined. The son has it full ownership. Right? The father kept a present interest to hang the painting as well for himself. And the son had the future interest to own that painting after the father dies. While the father's alive, the son can't do a damn thing. He, he can't see the painting. He can't uh, uh, put it on his wall. It's not his. All that he knows is at some point my dad will die. So when I ask Josh, what happens if the son dies first? And this, then the son's heir inherits the, the, the future interest. You can inherit a future interest. Once the father's dead, the bundle of sticks comes together full. And the son has a full bundle of sticks. He can sell it. He can do whatever he wants to it. Indeed, he does sell it for millions of dollars. Right? I want you to start thinking of property in this way. Right? It's not just who owns property, but when do they own it? The son has an interest in the painting. But that interest will not vest until the father dies. What the first letter did was the father conveyed to the son a future interest. The father gave a gift to the son of a future interest. And that gift cannot be revoked. Even if you... Right? It, it really doesn't matter. Because once you write a letter conveying a gift, you, you, no backseat, right? you can't undo it, no matter what your lawyers say. It's a symbolic delivery. The letter says, I'm giving you this future interest. And that gift cannot be revoked. That first letter was the gift. Now, Tatiana, let me ask you a question. Did it matter that the father never actually conveyed the property, to the, the, the painting to the son? I mean, a painting, you know, it's not that big. I can hand you a painting. And you're, you can pick up the frame. Does it matter that the physical painting was never actually delivered to the son? Why in this case is actual delivery not needed? What interest was the father giving the son? Was it a present interest? A future interest. In order to convey the future interest, you need to actually hand over the painting. It would even make sense to hand the painting over because it's not your to have yet. The way you convey a future interest is through a writing through symbolic delivery. So this case, right, really illustrates how future interests are applied by the entire book. Right? In the letter, the first letter, the father conveyed a future interest to the painting. In the letter, the father conveyed a future interest to the painting to the son. That gift could not be revoked. Could not be There was intent to give that future interest. Not bad legal counsel still intent. There was delivery, symbolic, through, through writing. And the son accepted that letter with joy on his first birthday. One, two, three, intent, delivery, acceptance, valid gift, cannot be revoked. But what makes this case so complicated why the mother-in-law, or the stepmother lost, is because he was conveying a future interest in the present moment. So, um, Jillian, William, William, let me ask you a question, please. This gift, you know what? Uh, let me ask a question. The son will get the painting when the father dies, right? Is this gift inter vivos or testamentary? But I thought he only gets it after the father dies. Why isn't that testamentary? Um, because it wasn't a, it wasn't a will. Exactly. That's what mother argued. It wasn't valid. Right. So why is this testamentary? Why is why is it interview? Why is it testamentary? Yeah, the baby is just on the exactly. Say that one more time, please. 
what interest we can pay while we're still alive. What do we call that interest? Yes, it cannot be revoked. A testamentary gift can be revoked. This is not testamentary. He gave a valid future interest while he was alive. You can do that. Right? If I tell my kid, you'll get this after I die, I'm giving a valid future interest in my life. It's not in the will. It's today because it can't be revoked. Yes, Courtney. So when the father was writing or having his will written, would he have had to even mention it? It wasn't his anymore. It's a gift. Yeah, because it was already given. That's right. Let me make a point up there. The second the father wrote this letter, his bundle of sticks was chopped up. It wasn't his to dispose of by will anymore. It was the son of future interest. Right? The father only had the right to possess it during his life. The father could have sold the painting. Wait for this. Alex, what happens if the father sold the painting during his life? What would happen when he died? Exactly. Goes to the son. Why? Did the father have the future interest in his bundle of sticks? So when you're buying the painting from the from the father, what are you actually buying? How long? No, your son didn't consent. When you buy the painting from the father, how long do you have to keep it for? The father duration of father's life. Very good. Excellent. Okay, you, this is good. Maybe okay, I got lucky, but you guys got this quicker than you students do. Let me give you some terminology, right? Which might make this easier or maybe hard. Right? There's two term there's a few terms I want to discuss here that, that we've mentioned. Present interest and future interest. We'll be stuck on this topic for next month or so. So if you don't get it, that's fine, but start getting it. Um, when we talk about the bundle of sticks, it includes two types of interest. Who owns it in the present and who owns it in the future? What the father did here was he kept a present interest for himself. He kept a present interest for himself for his life. And he gave a future interest to his son as a valid and grievous gift. Present interest. Everyone with me? Okay. We're going to have lots of names for different types of interest. I'll give you two now. Father, present interest is called a life estate. The father's present interest is called a life estate. What's a life estate? It's an interest to keep something while you're alive. It's a present. Once you die, the life estate terminates. Once you die, the life estate terminates. Come with me. Okay. So if the father has a life estate, what does the son have? It's called remainder. Remainder is a future interest that follows the life estate. Just write that down, trust me. A remainder is a future interest that follows a life estate. Right? So the father made interviewless gift. The interviewless gift was a remainder to the son. The father gave the son a remainder. That gift cannot be revoked. I don't care if you burn the letter, it doesn't work like that. The father gave the son a remainder. Because this was an interviewless gift, you did not need to comply with the statute of wills. There was no requirement to have witnesses. It was a valid interviewer's gift that cannot be revoked. And the son had that remainder just waiting for dear old dad to kick the bucket, waiting for dad to die. And then once the father died, the son had the remainder, and he got the dad's present interest. They merge, and he owns the entire painting. He now has what's called... You're gonna hate me. I'm sorry. It's, it's, I'm getting. I'm. I'm getting ready for the next class. The father house was called. I'm sorry. The son house was called a fee simple. Okay. You also see sometimes a fee simple absolute. I don't know if you write absolute, 
but you might see it also in the book of the fee simple absolute. A fee simple or a fee simple absolute is when a person has both the present and future interests. Right? He controls both the present and the future. When the father bought the painting at auction, he had a fee simple. He owned the present and future interests. The son, he chopped up his bundle of sticks. He chopped up his fee simple. He kept the present interest for himself, life estate. He gave a future interest to the son, remainder. When the father dies, the bundle comes back together. The son has a fee simple. Right, again, is a very complex concept. If you're sort of struggling, I, I, I feel your sympathy. I got you. I'll throw it more time. The father bought the painting at the auction. He had a fee simple. He had the full bundle of sticks. On the 21st birthday, he chopped up his bundle. He kept the present interest from gave a future interest to his son in remainder. Then when the father dies, the life state terminates. The son then has a fee simple. He has both the present and future interests, and he can sell it to whoever he wants. He put up for auction, made five million bucks. You need to start thinking about these terms. Present interest, future interests, fee simple. These are all different ways of doing inter vivos gifts. In this class, I don't care about testamentary gifts. I mean, I care about them, but not really. You'll take a class in wills and trusts later in law school, right? In this class, 99% of the questions are about interviewers' gifts, right? If your answer in the exam is, it's a testamentary gift, it's probably wrong. Not necessarily there might be cases where I might ask about it, but you're probably wrong. Almost always what I'm talking about is an interviewer's gift. And with interviewer's gifts, you have to keep in mind, there's always going to be a present interest and a future interest. And the sticks are always going to be split apart. They put back together. All right. Well, a few minutes for questions. Shadi, go ahead. Are we using the terms fee simple and fee simple absolute interchangeably? They're the same. I usually say fee simple, but you'll see fee simple absolute also. I, I prefer fee simple to use here, but... I'll explain to you why in about four weeks I don't like fee simple absolute, but, but I just I can't tell you if it makes sense. There, there, there are many types of fee simples. Let me just put it that way. There are different types of fee simples. You'll get there in a couple weeks. You thought this class was simple, didn't you? Right. This the reason why I love this case is it teaches you a concept without teaching it to you. Right, it sort of like teases it with actually explaining it. Nice to sort of bring it out. Questions? Yes, uh, Vani. Uh, every bundle, right? We're talking about the six in the bundle. Every bundle has both present and future interest. You always have it. You don't have to band them together. You can separate them, right? I give my, my one daughter a life, my second daughter a remainder. You can do that. You can chop up the bundle however you want. <clears throat> you can chop up the bundle however you want. Uh, you know about like, um, delivery to agents and like that. Like yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can deliver to an agent, that's fine. <clears throat> you imagine a person's in the hospital, they can't accept delivery, that, that's fine. Questions on this? All right, let me try, I know this a lot, let me try it one more time. Um, when you're thinking about the property, right, we talk about the bundle of sticks. You can look at the sticks in terms of what are you allowed to do? The right to exclude, the right to include, the right to buy, the right to sell. But you can also look at the, the sticks in terms of time. A stick can be present. Maybe, for example, that you have the right to possess it during your life, but he has the right to sell it after you die. Right? Every stick in the bundle has a time aspect to it. It can be either present or future. And you can slice them up differently. When you have the full bundle of sticks, you have a fee simple. 
You can do whatever you want to the property now or in the future. And with a fee simple, you can chop up the bundle. You can keep a life estate for yourself and give your son a remainder. This is actually, from, I talked about Playboy before, Hugh Hefner, right? The, the Playboy guy. Uh, he lived in a Playboy mansion. That's a, it's a house. Later in his life, he actually sold it. But he didn't sell it right away. He retained a life estate for himself. He basically sold a remainder to a buyer. And the deal was Hefner stays in the house till he dies. When he dies, the future interest merges with the present interest, right? So almost gets it. He did that so he could stay in the house for his life. He didn't care what happened after he died. Right? So you can do this. It's a way of making sure that while you're alive, you're taken care of, but once you die, you don't care anymore. Because of someone else. All right. Questions. I know you're you're all you're all just sort of floored. This happens every year when I take just teach this class. It seems so simple. There's a painting, there's a ring, a piano. All right, let me wrap up a bit and uh, let you go home and, and stew for some. I'll be in my office if you want to come back afterwards, come talk to me. That. That's fine. Um, so today we discuss a topic of gifts, right? And we have the three elements. You have to have the donative intent. You have to have the uh, delivery. You have to have acceptance. Um, delivery gets messy when it's either symbolic or constructive because courts are very worried about fraud. We don't really know what the person intended. Um, the modern preference is for courts to require a writing and not just sort of these extrinsic evidence. Okay? Um, but with intent... The courts are very skeptical of deathbed confessions. Those are very much disfavored now. We have testamentary versus interviewless gifts. An interviewless gift is when you give it an interest now in the present. And interviewless gifts cannot be revoked. Testamentary gifts can be revoked because they do not actually go into effect until after a person's death. But for a valid testamentary gift, you need to have the statute of wills complied with, which means two witnesses. Giving a person a future interest today, giving someone a remainder today, is inter vivos. It's not testamentary. That's why in Gruen, the mother lost, the stepmother lost, and the son prevailed. The very first letter gave a valid inter vivos gift of remainder, and that gift cannot be revoked. The son had the remainder. When the father died, the son received the full bundle of sticks. He had a fee simple, and it was his painting to sell. Questions? Liars. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Brianne. Um, so how does he change the fact and the painting that I have to mention? The father has to say, I am giving you this painting after my death. Right? And say not yet for a third possession. Or he say, I intend to give it to you after I die. But the key fact he says, I do this for my life, and it's like one of the life Okay. All right. The exit poll's running. If you can give me your comments, I'll go to my office if you want to talk. Uh, thank you so much. Please read carefully for Thursday. Super, super careful. All right. All right. I'll see you all later. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to